Uh, I'm really excited to hear uh, from Professor Seth Jepson uh, today. Uh, he is an associate professor of classical studies in the Department of Comparative Arts and Letters here at BYU. Uh, his research focuses on the performance of Greek and Roman theater and its modern reception. Uh, he has recently published a book titled Plautus Trin Trinimus as part of the Bloomsbury Ancient Comedy Com uh, Companions series. Seth uh, frequently teaches Latin and Greek courses here at BYU at all levels, as well as general education classes on Greek and Roman literature, mythology, and history. Uh, the title uh, of his t talk today is, What About Iphigenia? Reading Greek Mythology Through a Social Justice Lens. And we're very pleased that, that uh, Professor Jepson is also a faculty research fellow this semester at the Kennedy Center and is completing research on this topic in conjunction with one of our faculty research grants. Uh, we will go today uh, until about 1 p.m. At about uh, quarter two, we will move to a Q&A period and uh, invite you to participate in a discussion. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Jepson. All right, thank you. I'm really excited to see what exactly I'm going to be saying at 12.20. When, uh, when like FEMA-induced pandemonium breaks out in the room, it's going to be exciting. Uh, thanks, special thanks to the uh, Kennedy Center um, for uh, for selecting me as a as a research fellow this uh, this semester, and to Quinn Meekum for organizing this talk. Um, I also want to, um, as I start out here, I want to thank a couple people: my research assistant Grace Wilson for uh, helping me pull this talk together. Um, thanks also to my uh, colleagues in classics and Cal, and 15 years of mythology students at two universities for helping me think through the ideas in this paper. Um, also, thanks to Stacy Shaw and the MSW students in Social Work 623 class for allowing me to join them as an auditor um, this semester and learn more about social justice from a social work perspective. And the biggest thanks in that arena go to my wife, Janae, who, through her career in social work, has for many years given me fresh perspectives on very old texts. Um, this paper represents the beginning of a book project that brings together Greek and Roman mythology and social justice. In particular, I'll be presenting material from the introduction and a chapter on criminal justice from this book. Uh, since this is a work in progress, there are a lot of opportunities for new perspectives and different trajectories, so I'm eager to hear your questions and feedback afterward. Uh, but without further ado, let's head to the ancient Aegean. In 416 BC, in the depths of the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta, the Athenians found themselves at an impasse regarding how to deal with the island of Milos, an erstwhile colony of Sparta that had nevertheless managed to retain its neutrality for nearly two decades as the conflict raged between the two regional powers. As Thucydides narrates events, the Athenians, relying on purely utilitarian reasoning, decided that even a neutral Milos was too much of a threat, and with the unassailable Athenian navy surrounding the island, they presented the Melians with an ultimatum, join our side and fight against Sparta or be destroyed. After debate, the Melians offered to be friends with the Athenians but foes to neither side. A fair offer, and one that should have appealed to the ideals of freedom and autonomy so important to democratic Athens. In response, the Athenians immediately attacked, and after the unconditional surrender of the Melians, they executed all of the adult males on the island and brought the women and children to Athens in chains to be sold off as slaves, later colonizing the island for themselves. Now imagine if you were an Athenian at this time, how does one react to injustice committed at such a scale, especially by one's fellow citizens? Euripides responded by doing what he did best. He wrote a play, but not a play about Athenians or Spartans or the island of Milos. Instead, Euripides turned to the world of myth to tell a story about the aftermath of the fall of Troy. The Trojan women debuted in 415 BC, just months after the massacre on Milos, and it depicted in stark emotional detail the plight of the innocent victims of a war of aggression, with captive women and children of Troy crowded in slave huts along the beach, 
the ruins of their once proud palaces and homes in the background. At the climax of the play, Hecuba, once Priam's wife and queen of Troy, now just another slave, oversees the makeshift funeral of her grandson Astyanax, who, though only a child, was thrown from the city walls by the Greeks. His broken body now returned to her on the shield of her dead son, Hector. Hecuba cries out in despair, O oh, Greeks, your weapons had more force than sense, as the armed men forcibly drag her and the other captives toward the slave ships at the close of the play, while extras with lighted torches rush across the stage, symbolically setting fire to the ruined remains of the once mighty city. As they watched this spectacle, the assembled citizens in the audience couldn't help but connect the events on stage to the results of their own actions as aggressors on Milos a year earlier. Euripides was able to use myth to help his audience see the world through the perspective of an oppressed other and universalize the story in ways that would not have been possible if he had written specifically about the massacre on Milos instead of using myth to make his point. The distancing effect of discussing pressing issues through myth has allowed the play to retain its power and relevance today, as evidenced by the constant stream of performances and adaptations of Trojan women across the globe. As Simon Goldhill notes, tragedy, and we may add mythology in general, needs a detour through the other to make its emotional points. Um, as this example of the Trojan women shows us, even for the Greeks who invented these stories, the old adage about mythology is true. Myth is good to think with. One of the primary aspects of myth that allows it to work in this way is the paradoxical distancing and zooming effects that it entails. Since myths are set in faraway times and places, they provide distance from immediate political and dogmatic contexts that can inhibit people from genuinely engaging in politically charged topics, such as the vote to destroy Milos for the Athenians or the fairness of our current uh, criminal justice system for us. While myth creates distance from entrenched ideological positions on the one hand, on the other, the vibrancy of the narrative zooms in on the emotions and the perspectives of the individuals involved, thus helping readers see the world from a different perspective. In his article on, Aes on justice in Aeschylus' Oresteia, Peter Eubin explains that the distancing effect inherent in tragedy, quote, does not deprive issues of their urgency, but instead, by putting contemporary political debate into the costume of legendary living past, Aeschylus provides the audience with a magnified reflection of their own lives. With eyes on the action before them and thoughts on the decisions that confront them, they have an opportunity to turn sight into foresight and insight. While mythology, with its distancing and zooming effects, can help us think through important issues and see the world through a different lens, the efficacy of this for all members of society depends on what we are thinking about and which lenses we are using. Unfortunately, across the centuries between Homer and the here and now, there are numerous examples of mythology used to support destructive ideologies, such as imperialism, cultural chauvinism, racism, and misogyny. This is a problem for us because, for better or worse, in Western culture, we see ourselves as heirs of Greek and Roman culture, and at times we unwittingly become heirs of their prejudices and cultural baggage as well. Two relatively recent events convinced me that we need to find new ways to discuss the legacy of Greek and Roman culture. When the Me Too movement began building momentum in fall of 2017, people began asking in articles and blogs, but also in person, if Greek myth is so full of depictions of sexual violence, should we still even teach this stuff? Uh, it was a question that I took seriously at the time, and I wasn't sure that I had an answer for it. Uh, by the way, these, this is all um, art projects from students in my mythology classes over the years. Um, the second event was the insurrection at the US Capitol on January 6th. While the violence and threat to democracy were bad enough in themselves, what was even more chilling to me was the way the images and narratives from the Greek and Roman world were used to justify and instigate the violence. Is this really what the legacy of Greece and Rome amounts to? And if so, is this part of our cultural heritage that is best left behind? Since I'm a classicist and devoted my career to the study and teaching of Greek and Roman culture, I desperately want the answer to be no. But I couldn't just go back to business as usual after these events. In the wake of all of this, in the winter of 2021, I came to the conclusion that if we don't like the ideologies that others are supporting through their use of Greek and Roman culture, 
then we just need to use myth to build something better, to both preserve culture and transform it in beneficial ways. And for me, the answer to accomplishing this was to turn to social justice. So what does it mean to read ancient literature through a social justice lens? Well, let's start with a working definition. Social justice is the practice of working toward equity throughout social systems, taking into account intersexual identities, including but not limited to race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, ability, age, class, economic background, etc. Social justice accords dignity to all members of a community and creates a framework for them to choose their own way of life in pursuit of happiness. Now, there are pitfalls and potentials for prolonged debates in every word of this definition, and perhaps we'll talk about some of them in the Q&A, but for now I'd like to offer a few principles that guide social justice work, both in the community and in close readings of literature. Social justice is aware, equitable, communal, and active. The first of these principles, awareness, um, uh, social justice readings are aware of the factors of identity, privilege, power, and oppression. They try to elucidate how societal structures often work through these factors to maintain injustice and imbalance. This sense of awareness includes an acknowledgement of the trauma that individuals experience as a result of oppression. Awareness also entails a commitment to listen to and believe members of subordinated groups and other victims of violence and oppression when they talk about their experiences and a willingness to see the world through the perspective of the other. Social justice readings are equitable. Um, the fair distribution of uh, goods, opportunities, and privileges has been a locus of debate and discussions of justice from Plato to the present. In emphasizing equity rather than equality, we focus distribution on the needs of individuals in the community and the means for them to achieve fair outcomes. Or in other words, distribution matches needs, not status, privilege, or productivity. Social justice readings are communal in that they recognize that the attainment of social justice is not an individual affair, but relies on the cooperation of a diverse and supportive community. Discussions of justice from Kant to Rawls have focused so much on individual freedom of choice that in the insistence that our only moral encumbrances are those that we freely choose, we can lose sight of obligations that we have as members of a community. Michael Sandel writes, with belonging comes responsibility. You can't really take pride in your country and its past if you're unwilling to acknowledge any responsibility for carrying its story into the present and discharging the moral burdens that may come with it. For Sandel, belonging to a community entails a certain moral obligation that we don't choose, but which are ours by virtue of our membership in that community, including obligations to make amends for injustices perpetrated by ancestors or compatriots. Looking at social justice through a communal lens can also draw attention to the realm of interactional justice, which involves how individuals treat each other in day-to-day -day interactions and is something that we have control over for ourselves and can also influence the behavior of others. It's a grassroots kind of justice that begins at the micro level in one-on-one -on -one interactions and then proceeds to the macro. And finally, social justice is active. Um, as Morgan and Capu de Silas say, social justice is active justice. It should be enacted through a sense of duty and responsibility to others. Regarding engaging in social justice work, Isabel Wilkerson says that everyone should start with their own specialty and focus on regular interactions within their sphere of influence. For many of us here, social justice action can include education, developing an ability to see the world from another perspective, someone who has an identity different from our own, is a crucial component in social justice education. And we can help ourselves and students develop this skill. Uh, there it is. I was really excited to see what I was going to be saying there. Yeah. So that's right. So now it's all emphasized. Social justice is active. <laughs> um, so uh, with, this, with these uh, definitions in mind, 
Um, when we read something through a social justice lens, it involves rereading, meaning analyzing texts in new ways, and looking for the operation of identity, privilege, power, and oppression within a text, and within the way people, scholars, have um, discussed texts. It also involves retelling, exploring adaptations and receptions of myth. Um, since action is such an important uh, aspect of social justice work, oh, it's coming back, no. Um, we can talk about um, obstacles, that, uh, obstacles to social justice that, uh, that engaging with mythology can help us overcome. Um, so some of these obstacles are uh, system justification bias and a ten tendency toward pro-self pro or versus pro-social disposition. A system justification bias is the um, conscious or unconscious motivation to defend, bolster, and justify existing social, economic, and political institutions and arrangements. According to system justification theory, all of us are motivated to varying degrees as a function of both dispositional and situational factors to rationalize away the moral and other failures of our social, economic, and political institutions. Uh, fortunately, engaging purposefully with myth through literature and art can help us overcome these obstacles by encouraging us to see the world from, the, from a different point of view and helping us imagine more inclusive communities. This is something that I do in my um, mythology classes here on campus um, by using myth to have discussions about things like uh, misogyny and sexual violence, uh, refugee resettlement, equitable treatment of those who identify as LGBTQ, mass incarceration, and suicide awareness. Now, I'm not just going off script here and using myth in this way. There are good precedents for engaging with myth um, in this fashion. Uh, and we're going to talk about the work of Jonathan Shea and Brian Doherty's in relation to this. Uh, Jonathan Shea, in the 1980s, began conducting therapy groups for Vietnam veterans that employed reading and discussing Homer's Iliad. Um, and he talks about these in his book, Achilles in Vietnam. Shea notes direct similarities between the experiences of modern combat veterans and the events narrated in the Iliad. Shea also argues that the performance of mythological tragedies was the principal means through which Athenians reintegrated combat veterans into the community. Uh, he, he argues... We must create new, our own new models of healing, which emphasize communalization of the trauma. We need a modern equivalent of Athenian tragedy. Brian Doherty's took up this challenge when he began uh, organizing table readings of Greek tragedy for active duty military personnel and their families, focusing on themes of injury, betrayal, and suicidality in Sophocles, Philoctetes, and Ajax. He remarks, Sophocles' plays emerge as a powerful tool an ancient military technology designed to help those who'd been to war make meaning out of their fragmented memories and to evenly distribute the burden of what they brought back from battle upon the shoulders of all Athenians. After using Greek myths to help combat veterans, Doris began thinking of what other audiences uh, might be helped by Greek tragedies, which led him to perform Prometheus Bound for prison personnel and women of Trachis for hospice workers, patients, and families. In doing this, he realized that what he found was multiple communities of people who wanted to face the darkness together and tell their stories. In other words, the power of myth to communalize and work through trauma is not limited to battlefield trauma, as Doherty's discovered. Reading and discussing myth can just as well be used to address trauma that is incident to the various forms of injustice and oppression that persist in society. So while ancient and modern uses of Athenian tragedy provide an entrance into working with myth in this way, the efficacy of myth to create and heal communities is not limited to the immediate context of Shays or Doherty's work. In fact, uh, Yuval Noah Harari in his book Sapiens argues that the human ability to tell myths, something unique in the world of animal communication, is what initially allowed humans to create successful communities of diverse individuals working towards a common goal. It's not a stretch to claim that myth can be used to help build a better community. Storytelling is part of what makes us humans. It's in our DNA, entrenched in our evolutionary past. Problems in our communities are related to problems in the stories we tell. 
if we want a better community, a beloved community, as Reverend King calls it, it's time for us to change the way we tell stories. In the time remaining, I'd like to engage in two brief close readings that demonstrate this approach to myth. One is from Sophocles' Oedipus, Oedipus Tyrannus, and um, the other is from Aeschylus' Oresteia. So, um, one of the challenges of working with Sophocles' Oedipus is that one inevitably has to deal with the disinterred specter of Sigmund Freud. I like this one. This is from his, his, uh, the, the Wikipedia page. This page has some issues. Okay. All right, all right, just one more, just one more. Uh, it's too easy. All right. Um, well, there are many things we might say about Freud's use of the Oedipus myth. The point I want to take issue with here is the focus on individual rather than community that comes with Freud's reading of the play. By moving the story from the theater to the therapist's couch, Freud has, for the last hundred years, focused our attention primarily on the individual psychological aspects of the myth, which is a far cry from the communal context in which the ancient Athenian audience would have experienced the play. Attendance at the theater in our culture is largely private, personal, anonymous, and invisible. This is nothing at all like the experience of the Athenian theater uh, goer during the time of Sophocles. At the theater of Dionysus in Athens, only one play at a time was shown and the citizens were present not as a leisure activity, but as a civic and religious obligation, sitting in their voting districts in broad daylight, seeing and being seen. A sense of community and shared civic purpose permeated every aspect of the event. Taking this ancient context into consideration, one of the questions we should have for, for Oedipus is what can the story teach us as a group rather than as individuals? Is the, play, the play begins by focusing on a disaster facing Thebes as a community, not Oedipus as an individual. A plague has fallen upon the city of Thebes, and as the scene opens, a crowd of suppliants with olive branches and wreaths, led by a priest, approach the palace of Oedipus to beg for his aid. The visual impact of this opening <clears throat> is mostly lost on a modern reading audience, unless we imagine an impressive tableau of silent actors spread across the stage, pleading with Oedipus for help, in the same way that crowds would plead for succor at the temples of the gods in times of disaster. This vivid scene of a community in pain and grief, suffering the effects of a plague, would have immediately resonated with the people of Athens, who only two years earlier, in 431 BC, had lived through a devastating plague themselves at the outset of the Peloponnesian Wars. Back in the play, we soon find out through a message that Creon brings from the oracle that the visible sickness in the city is just a symptom of a deeper issue, a crime that lies under the surface committed years ago, but not resolved, a wound in the city that went unhealed. In the play, this crime is the murder of the former King Laius, who turns out to have been Oedipus's father, and was killed by Oedipus at a chance meeting at a crossroads before Oedipus came to Thebes. The Greeks believed that various acts of injustice, if not ritually expiated, would create a miasma, a pollution that would poison a person, family, or city until proper rituals of cleansing and atonement were performed. The Greek concept of miasma is an apt metaphor for considering the dysfunction caused by generations of unresolved social injustices in our culture. This opening to the play can lead us to ask ourselves, what unresolved acts of violence, what unhealed wounds lie under the surface of our communities? This could be wounds of colonial appropriation, destruction of native lives and cultures, racial violence, misogyny, ableism, homophobia, or any of the myriad other ways humans find to subordinate one group to another. I'm going to read some passages from the opening of Oedipus, and I want you to take a moment and think about scenes you have witnessed of plagues in our culture that are caused by unhealed wounds of the past. Consider how these lines can resonate for us now. This is the priest's description at the beginning of the play. For the city, as you see yourself, is pitched and tossed beyond endurance. It can no longer lift its head from the depths, the surge of blood. There's death in the fruit and folding buds of earth, death among the pasturing flocks, death in the barren pangs of our women. A fiery god swoops down and drives the city headlong. The hateful plague by which the house of Cadmus is emptied and black Hades made rich with cries and groans. 
This is the choral entry song, at the, the song the chorus sings when they enter the stage. The city, perishing, loses count of her dead. Her sons, unpitied, no one to lament them, strew the ground to breed yet still more death. Here and there, young wives and gray-haired mothers huddle at altars, groaning, crying to be freed of pain. The pian blazes to the sound of voices keening. Oh, against all this, golden daughter of Zeus, send us protection. Isabel Wilkerson likens the racial caste system in the U.S. to a pathogen that mutates and resurfaces every generation, like a plague under a new guise, continually finding ways to defeat the treatment we prescribe through legislation and education. Regarding the civil rights legislation of the 1960s, Wilkerson states, we changed the laws, but we didn't change ourselves. As it turns out, laws can be reversed. The question that the chorus asks as they enter the stage could equally be asked by us the next time a headline drops, announcing another incident of racial violence. What is the debt you will exact of me? Is it new or come back again with the seasons coming round? As the play progresses, we increasingly shift focus to the story of Oedipus as an individual, but in his story, there's still a message for the community. When we read Oedipus with an eye to group identity, we see that Oedipus can be understood as a symbol for how not to react when we receive information that contradicts the narratives that we tell ourselves about our group identity or about our past. One of the curious things about uh, one of the curious things about Sophocles' Oedipus is that the conflict in the play, unlike other Greek tragedies, deals entirely with the discovery of past events rather than the committing of an unavoidable error in the present. During the course of the play, there's nothing that Oedipus can do to prevent himself from becoming the person who kills his father and marries his mother. Those acts are already decades old. The only question is whether Oedipus will discover and accept the truth about his past. What strikes me about Sophocles' story is not the way that Oedipus continually reverts to the narrative of his past that he knows by heart, but rather the violence with which he's willing to support this narrative, which gets increasingly intense as the play progresses. When Oedipus encounters information that is new to him, especially the suggestion that his past actions and the privilege he now enjoys could be to blame for the problems of the city, he responds with denial and violence. He accuses Tiresias of plotting a coup against him. He even tells his friend and relative Creon that he won't be satisfied until he sees him dead. When the old Theban shepherd comes on stage with the final piece of the puzzle that reveals Oedipus' identity, Oedipus orders the shepherd to be tied up until he finally divulges what he knows. At the very moment before the truth dawns on him, Oedipus' denial about his past, as I argue, leads him to break the conventions of the Athenian stage and enact a violent scene of interrogation by torture right before the audience's eyes. It's a well-known convention in Greek tragedy that the most exciting things happen off stage and are only narrated through messenger speeches, the opposite of our action-centered entertainment today. While this injunction against portraying violence on the stage may be a general rule of the genre, as with many art forms, rules become most meaningful when they're broken. And I believe that's what happens in this scene when Oedipus tortures the shepherd on stage. Many scholars of tragedy would likely disagree with my reading of this scene from Oedipus because it can be and frequently has been performed without enacting any violence on stage. However, when it comes to reading ancient drama with its lack of stage directions, I'm a fan of believing what characters say they're doing in the dialogue, even if it goes against accepted scholarly wisdom. The scene in question begins at line 1119 when the old shepherd is brought in from the countryside, the one surviving witness to King Laius' death and the man who gave the baby Oedipus to the Corinthian messenger decades earlier, instead of leaving the child for dead as he was ordered. The shepherd knows who Oedipus is and knows that he himself holds the key to revealing Oedipus as both the murderer of Laius and as the son of Jocasta and Laius. For obvious reasons, he doesn't want to divulge this information. In the first half of the scene, he provides only short, vague answers to the questions he is asked. At lines 1142 to 5, the Corinthian messenger asks if the shepherd remembers the child he gave him all those years ago and reveals that Oedipus is, in fact, the child in question. When the shepherd hedges and refuses to answer the question, Oedipus lets his famous temper get the best of him and shouts, if you don't want to tell me as a favor, you can tell it to me while screaming in pain. 
The participle klion, which I've translated as screaming in pain, can mean just to weep or lament, but it's also often used to describe the sounds people make when they're being beaten or tortured. At this, the shepherd exclaims desperately, for God's sake, don't torture an old man, using the term aikidzo, which means to torture as punishment or as part of an interrogation. Oedipus then calls to one of his attendants on stage, played by a silent extra, and says, someone twist this man's hands behind his back and fast. The verb apostrepho here is used of preparing hands or feet to be tied, but it also implies a tw act of twisting and wrenching that itself inflicts pain. Uh, this is the same word that's used in the Odyssey in Book 22 when the goat herd Melanthius is tied up and hung from the ceiling before being mutilated and killed in gruesome fashion. When we take these philological details into account, Oedipus is clearly instructing an attendant to hold the shepherd while he interrogates him through torture. This scenario, unfortunately, would have been familiar to uh, the Athenian audience. Athens was a slaveholding society, and the torture of slaves was a common occurrence. In fact, the testimony of an enslaved person was not admitted in court proceedings unless it had been obtained through torture. As the scene continues, Oedipus asks a series of questions, and the shepherd slowly reveals the truth one gobbit at a time. Interspersed between the shepherd's answers are exclamations such as, Wretch, why, what more do you want to know? And if only I had died that day, to which Oedipus responds, you may come to that yet. When the shepherd begs, for God's sake, master, don't ask any further, Oedipus follows with, you are already dead if I have to ask you again. This exchange suggests that torture may soon proceed to murder. After all, we know Oedipus is capable of this, and the shepherd knows this best of all, since he, for decades, has carried the trauma of witnessing the killing of Laius and his fellow attendants years earlier. Eventually, the truth of Oedipus's origins spills out, and Oedipus rushes off stage to turn his blinding violence against himself. Whatever was enacted on stage during this scene would likely have only been a stylized approximation of an actual slave interrogation, but the language itself is enough to connect this moment to scenarios that the slaveholders in the audience knew quite well. At this final moment before his recognition and reversal of fortune, Oedipus's drive to discover the truth of his past, ironically combined with his inability to see that truth plainly presented to him, boils up in a flood of anger and denial that lead him to break the conventions of the theater in his desperate attempt to hold on to the narrative of his past that he knows, despite the overwhelming evidence against it. We can certainly see in this scene themes of identity, privilege, power, and oppression in Athenian society, and we can use these themes to draw lessons for our own time. Oedipus thinks he knows his own story, and he's willing to bet everything on it. James Baldwin, in The Fire Next Time, says, those who unwittingly perpetuate racial violence in our country are, quote, in effect, trapped in a history which they do not understand, and until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. This is precisely the problem that Oedipus experiences. He cannot be released from his past until he understands it, and when he's invited to do so, instead of doing the hard work of looking inside himself, he explodes outward in violence. We see such outbursts of violence again and again in our country, the myths of white supremacy, manifest destiny, and God-given dominion are powerful intoxicants that are hard to quit. While Oedipus does terrible things, some unwittingly and some not, it is important to remember that he is also a victim of generational abuse and dysfunction. While most people nowadays know Sophocles' version of Oedipus' myth, few people, fewer people know the full backstory. The curse that the oracle pronounced on the unborn Oedipus, that he would kill his father and marry his mother, was divine retribution for a crime that Laius committed years earlier when he was a tutor for a young man named Chrysippus, the son of King Pelops. Laius abducted Chrysippus and sexually assaulted him, then returned to Thebes as if nothing had happened. He received the oracle about his own child, uh, and, and when, he, when this happened, instead of trying to atone for his past crime, Laius tries to evade responsibility with more violence, mangling the feet of his newborn child and sending him to die alone in the wilderness. In effect, Oedipus and his entire household are punished for the crimes of his father. In our culture, are there ways in which we still suffer because of decisions or errors of our ancestors? Do we ever unwittingly do things because of elements of our cultural backstory things such as systemic racism, unconscious bias, etc. Do we, like Laius and Oedipus, seek to run away from the oracles that proclaim our collective faults rather than repairing the original promises? 
We can't move on as a unified community until we address the wounds of our past and heal. And examples of truth and reconciliation processes in post-war Germany and post-apartheid South Africa show that communal healing is possible. Know whence you came, Baldwin enjoys, for if you know whence you came, there really is no limit to where you can go. This reading of Oedipus encourages us to be open to change and willing to accept responsibility and heal as a unified community. Uh, but where do we start? One such area I'm working on now connects Aeschylus' Oresteia with a discussion of the criminal justice system in the U.S. Um, the Oresteia, if you're unfamiliar with it, was a trilogy of plays written by Aeschylus that tells the story of the household of Agamemnon, the general of the Greek army at Troy. Um, after Paris had kidnapped Helen and the Greek army was assembled to go to Troy to bring her home, the fleet was stuck at the port of Aulis by contrary winds sent by the gods. In order to set sail and begin the promised war, the gods required Agamemnon to sacrifice his daughter Iphigenia. To lure the young woman to the Greek camp, Agamemnon told his wife Clytemnestra that he had arranged a marriage between Iphigenia and the hero Achilles. When they brought Iphigenia to the altar for the wedding, instead of seeing her would-be groom there, it was just her father and his attendants waiting with a knife to perform the vile deed. After Iphigenia's death, the fleet was able to sail off to Troy, where the Greeks remained for ten years before they conquered the city. In the first play of the trilogy, titled Agamemnon, Clytemnestra sets a trap for Agamemnon and kills him in the bath upon his return home, exacting revenge for Iphigenia's, Iphigenia's death. In the second play, Libation Bearers, Orestes, the son of Agamemnon, returns home from exile, and at the orders of Apollo, he kills his mother, in order to avenge the death of his father. At the end of the play, a group of dreadful goddesses called the Furies rise from Clytemnestra's blood and torment Orestes for murdering his own mother. In the final play of this set, Eumenides, Orestes goes to Delphi to be ritually purified of the killings and then travels to Athens where he becomes the defendant in the first ever trial by jury, organized by Athena herself, with the Furies serving as prosecutors and Apollo as counsel for the defense. Apollo argues that the Furies, whose jurisdiction is to prosecute kin murder, have no case since there's no blood relationship between mother and child. The mother, according to Apollo, only incubates the seed planted by the father. The vote of the jury is tied until Athena casts the deciding vote in favor of Orestes' acquittal, boldly proclaiming, there's no mother who gave birth to me, with all my heart I hold with what is male. When the Furies threaten to bring destruction to the land of Athens, Athena persuades them to accept instead an honored position as protectors of the land and release from their role as tormentors. The Furies accept and become, uh, they become instead the kindly-minded ones. And the trilogy ends with a costume change for the fur Furies and a double chorus dancing and celebrating the glory of Athens. The myth is usually read as a celebration of the development of the Athenian system of trial by jury, and that is in many ways the foundation of our own. And to be certain, the trial by jury system is a marked improvement over the system of vendetta justice that is replaced in the myth. At the same time, however, certain details in the narrative give the impression that there's still work to do. For starters, it's very clear that Apollo and Athena are, are biased in their administration of the court proceedings. Um, Apollo reverts to rhetorical tricks and threats of violence instead of actually engaging in the argument of the Furies. And, uh, and the claim about the relationship, about not having a blood relationship between mothers and children is a wildly misogynistic one and not one that everyone in Athens would have agreed with on the time, as is represented um, in the uh, split vote by the jury. Um, so when we note how criminal justice in the humanities ends up being um, an expression of misogynistic bias, it can help us ask how impartial our system of justice is and whether it too is founded on deep-seated biases. In her book, The New Jim Crow, Michelle Alexander explains how the system of mass incarceration in the U.S. and the laws pertaining to uh, permitting discrimination against individuals charged with a felony has become a new manifestation of old racial biases and a proxy for the supposedly abolished Jim Crow mentality. Um, let's see, for the sake of time, I'm gonna jump forward here, just talk about um, uh, Iphigenia and how she comes into this. I think 
considering the absence of Iphigenia in the court proceedings, she's not brought up by the Furies as part of the reason why this whole series of vendetta killings happened in the first place. She's, she's conspicuously absent. But um, at the end of the court scene, Orestes gives this, gives this victory speech where he calls on Zeus as he talks about this uh, ritual of a third libation and calls on Zeus the Savior. And this is an echo back to a moment in the first play when the chorus is narrating the death of Iphigenia. And so if this were a symphony, it would be like hearing the Iphigenia theme coming up here at the end of the play. And we're reminded of, of her death and, um, and how the attendants of Agamemnon stood by and watched, people who knew her. And this is, this is how the text goes. Um, it says, she was like a painting central figure, struggling to speak to them, since often in her father's generous banqueting hall she'd sung a hymn full of blessing in the chaste voice of a virgin when the father she loved poured out the third libation. With loving reverence she sang. Uh, and so when we pay attention to the echo of Iphigenia's theme at the end of the trilogy, we see that the wounds of the household are hidden rather than healed. In this construction of justice, certain victims are ignored and certain types of violence are condoned, such as male against female and father against child. Reading the Oresteia through a social justice lens can help us ask which victims are ignored and which acts of violence are condoned in our system. Which collective wounds does our justice system hide rather than heal? Which groups have we deemed as acceptable sacrifices for a veneer of justice? This reading of Oresteia calls us to remember them, and remember them in their innocence and wholeness, when once, like Iphigenia, they sang and danced carefree in their father's halls at the third libation. I hope that these examples of reading myth through a social justice lens have demonstrated how these texts, though thousands of years old, are still good to think with. When we roll back the tape and contemplate the sacrifices that launched the project of our country, that permitted our departure from Aulis, as it were, will we turn our eyes away in shame and continue to make utilitarian excuses about collateral damage, the good of the whole? Will we, like Oedipus, double down with violence and threats on the narratives that preserve the privileges of those in power? Or will we finally have the courage to step between the victim and the knife and say, enough? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was uh, really um, remarkably insightful. We will uh, now turn to audience uh, discussion. Uh, we have time for a number of questions. Uh, we will go until 1 p.m. If you do have a question, please just raise your hand. We have a microphone uh, that will come to you. And uh, we ask that you stand up and uh, tell us just who you are, if you're a student, what you're studying at BYU. Uh, and uh, we appreciate your participation. If you need to leave for 1 p.m. classes, you can also do so now. Hi, I'm Alyssa. I'm taking this class. I'm a psych major, and I'm minoring in global women's studies. Um, this is kind of have to do with this and more about like Greek and stuff, but I just started reading Emily Wilson's uh, at our translation of the Iliad, and I was wondering how a woman's translation um, would kind of go along with this of viewing things through a social lens, how things have changed, and what your thoughts of it are. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Emily Wilson um, does, does a great job with with her translations, and, and actually the, the one line that I, that I read from Trojan Women at the beginning of the play comes from her translation of the Trojan Women. Um, I think one of the things that she does a really good job at is um, she's attuned to, um, to these like systems of, of oppression and, and like uh, female identity in these ancient texts, and in her translations she brings out some of those some of those aspects, and so things that, you know, tr translation is always such a tricky endeavor, but she, I, I can't think of any specific examples off the top of my head from her translations, but just in general, she does a good job at paying attention to those social justice factors of, 
of identity and oppression and finding ways to address those in her, um, in, in her translation choices. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, I'm pre-med here at BYU, and I also just started Emily Wilson's um, Odyssey, um, which is like, it's like kind of an endeavor for someone who's not used to reading theater or Greek myth. But I wanted to ask you, along the notes of this last question, how do you think that our understanding of myth is shaped by the people who are allowed to or not allowed to translate it? Because obviously like, most of us don't speak Greek. Right. I, I, think, I think this is a really, a really important question, and... Um, yeah, there's a lot when when you're when you're just relying on a translation of a text. There's a lot going on under the surface. So, like in my my example from Oedipus, um, choosing to translate some of those words as like like the word for like wrenching the arm behind the back, translating it in a way that shows the violence that that's inherent in that. Some other translations will say like like grab him and restrain him or something. Be like a little bit more calm. Um, and maybe not, maybe not really show what's going on in the text. Um, but I think this, I, I, you know, I had some slides up here that were talking about um, the prevalence of sexual violence in, in mythology. Um, and, and this question of translation becomes really important for that. How do you translate these, these stories about, um, about sexual violence? Do you use words like rape or do you um, often often people will use like paraphrases like, um, you know, like Zeus loved her or ravished her or like they, they'll say like, they'll use marriage as well. And I'm like, that's not what's going on. This is, this is a question of, of sexual violence. Um, there's, let me see if I can open this up quickly here. Um, the in in the longer version of this talk, I, I cut a bunch of stuff out of it. Um, I had a an excerpt from. Let's see, I'm not going to be able, able to open it quickly. It was an excerpt from a children's book of of myths. I'll just paraphrase it. Um, they're talking about um, Apollo attempting to rape Daphne. And Daphne is able to escape by being turned into a tree. And this particular collection says, poor Daphne would rather be a tree than accept the, uh, the honor of, of being a bride of Apollo. And just like the way of telling the story in that way puts so much like shame and, um, and, and, and blame on victims. Um, or, or, you know, uh, po potential victims of sexual violence. And so the, the way that these stories are translated and who's telling them and the way that they tell them is, is, is at the heart of this issue. So thank you for bringing that up. Are there other questions? Yeah, my name is Nate. I study political science here. Um, one question I have is when you're talking about some of those issues, uh, specifically the um, appropriation by the far right of some elements of Greek and Roman mythology to justify or um, their, the violence of the capital, how can we, uh, specifically to those when we teach these things in schools, how can we s emphasize the positive elements of this mythology and make sure to try to avoid the appropriation or corruption of the myths in education? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, for, for me, I, my approach to this, as you saw in so, some of those slides of uh, presentations I do in my mythology class, I think it's important not to avoid the difficult conversations Right, but to, to acknowledge that, hey, this, this material has been used to justify, um, you know, imperialism and colonization and um, nationalism of, of various sorts. And, um, and, to, and I think if you, if, if you start with examples from other cultures, um, I, again, in the, in the longer version of this, I had some, had some examples of this at the beginning. Um, 
there's, uh, there's these, uh, these images from Roman culture. The Romans were the first ones to appropriate Greek myth and use it for, um, for like imperialistic purposes. And there's this image of emperors, the emperors Claudius and Nero, um, but they're like put into these mythological sculptures of battles with the Amazons. And you have these defeated Amazon warriors that the emperors are like dragging off the battlefield. And they're labeled with the provinces of the Roman Empire, Britannia and Armenia. And, and so if you start with showing examples from another culture, like, like we can look at that and be like, that's messed up. Like why are you using Greek myth to, to support this kind of violence? And if you, if you, that's, that's one of the great things about the way that myth can provide like some distance for discussing these difficult things. If you look at that and say like, this is problematic. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be using myth to justify treating other people this way. And then show images from, from the capital that maybe people who would be more inclined to justify the violence at the capital might, if they've already been primed by looking at some of these other examples, think like, oh, maybe, Maybe like any time we're using a narrative to justify violence against another group, we need to stop and rethink that. Yeah. Hi, I'm I'm Dan. I'm also a political science major. Um, I thought it was really interesting when you were talking about, or I think it was one of the slides where it was talking about how, like the laws can change, but then the won't necessarily change the situation. Yeah. Um, so obviously, for most of history, that's how we've enacted social change. So do you have any ideas how, how we could apply this to our society um, out, outside of that? Or? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, pa passing legislation and doing these kind of reforms, I think is a really, a really important aspect of this, of this conversation. And, um, and you know, in the in the story of Aeschylus's Oresteia, you have this move to setting up a system of trial by jury, and like that was a huge legal advancement and uh, and the benefit. And so it's definitely part of the story. But what what I like, um, I, I guess that that other quote. This came from Isabel Wilkerson, the author of the book Cast, um, and. This was in an interview that she, she gave where she said this, that like we changed the laws, but we didn't change ourselves. I think that's changing ourselves is the other, other side of that. And so I don't, changing laws, that seems like big for me. I, I don't know, I don't know how, got, how to go about doing that, but like, you know, I, I uh, study literature and mythology, and I think engaging with literature and art, that's something that we can do to change ourselves, right? It can, it's, uh, you know, traveling, doing, we're, we're here in the Kennedy Center, doing study abroad, seeing um, other people, how they live in other places of the world. Um, that's, that's a great way to do it. But also, if you, can't, if you can't just hop on a plane to go somewhere, pick up a book, go to a museum, look at, look at art and really engage with it, and that's something that can change you. And a, a sincere engagement with the arts and the humanities gives you a love for all of the human family. And that's something that then changes that other side of things. Like we can change the laws, but we also need to change ourselves and, uh, and help ourselves uh, um, develop this, uh, this sense of, of care for all humanity. Hi, my name is Mackenzie. I'm studying art history here. Um, so with art, is there like any way, like a lot of Greek art is like really loved in classical culture. Um, so is there any way that like those sculptures of these myths can like help looking at like mythology through a social lens or is there like not really a relationship between like art um, and that? Um, yeah, uh, I have in, in, in the presentation that I do on misogyny and sexual violence, I show, I show a, a set of like four different pieces of art, three paintings and one sculpture that are all labeled the rape of Helen. And see how, just how we talked about how translation, you can present things in different ways. The, the way you present a story in art can tell the story in different ways. Whether, does Helen leave with Paris um, consensually? If, if, you, if you know the movie Troy, right, 
Menelaus is a big jerk and Paris is played by Orlando Bloom, and so of course Helen wants to go with Orlando Bloom, <laughs> right? Um, but how, how you depict these, these stories in art can, can change the way they're told. And sometimes you do have a lot of, a lot of art based on classical myth that uh, you know, shows, shows sexual violence or shows um, you know, some sort of cultural chauvinism depicts um, other peoples in a negative light, shows like Greek and Roman superiority over them. One of the things I really like for both literature and, and visual arts is reception, looking at how, how artists and authors today will take those and flip them around, do interesting things with them. One that comes to mind off the top of my head is um, Luis Alfaro's um, adaptations of Greek tragedy. He has one where he takes the, the story of Medea, and he, he tells this story, the, the title of his version is Mohada, and he tells this story of um, illegal immigrants coming to, um, coming to the U.S. and their experiences, and really cuts to the heart of some of the cultural chauvinism in the story of, of Medea, but like uses this story not to support that, uh, that cultural chauvinism, but to fight against it in our own culture. I think we're just about out of time. Thank you all for your questions and your comments. And